All right. Well, this is, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you about this, this topic today. Some of you, I, I know, have probably seen some of this information that's been presented because we do have a second grant um, through uh, ONDCP, which is the Office of National Drug Control Policy. They set all the federal schedules for all the different drugs that, that are out there, um, whether they're allowed, legal or illegal, and what category they go into. Um, so they funded us for the first year of this project, and then one of their satellite groups, the National Marijuana Initiative, which sounds like they're trying to legalize marijuana, but they're not. Um, they are actually a law enforcement agency that has funded us for the past couple of years. And so as um, was mentioned uh, before, this project has been ongoing for a long time. And the idea is to use marijuana as a trace material at crime scenes and also to see if we can figure out where it's coming from. And that fits into a bigger picture of sourcing all kinds of materials that could be considered biologicals or bioterrorist type agents. Um, so hopefully you'll kind of see where that, that fits in um, here. And, and actually, I, I feel like even though I'm the person standing up here, uh, you folks have been working for a long time uh, on this project because even when I was at the Division of Scientific Services in Connecticut, we had UNH students doing internships funded by the NIJ. Um, so there's a lot of flow back and forth, um, and we've been working together for about eight, ten years on this. Um, so I'm going to talk just for a short while today, uh, about 20, 25 minutes. Feel free to ask questions. And then I have a video um, that was provided by our funding agency that talks to you about what's going on on the other coast. Because viewpoints on marijuana are pretty different on the east coast versus the west coast. And uh, you'll see kind of the pros and the cons, I hope, by the time we get done with all of this. Can everybody hear me? Yes? OK. OK, great. All right, so um, we're talking about drug trafficking, border security, uh, marijuana, how does that all fit in? Um, there's lots of different technologies out there that are used to try and figure out the sources of where things are coming from that are transiting across our borders. Um, a lot of it is not publicly available. It's military level technology, um, and it's not publicly available for a reason, but some of it is released. So if you're trying to track something across the border, uh, what can you look at? You can look at packaging. You can look at fingerprints. Um, you could be an undercover agent, which is what the espionage uh, word up there is for. And a lot of the people I have been talking to every April, uh, there's a, a meeting um, that's held in a different location every year um, of undercover agents. And they're basically giving feedback. We provide feedback to them on what our pro how our project is going. And they give us feedback on what kind of technology they could use um, in, their, in their efforts. Um, most of the time when we talk about marijuana or cannabis, we're talking about contents of packages. And so that's what I'll focus on pretty much today. And most of you know, um, if you're at all in forensic science, that we look at the chemistry of marijuana to classify it. But there are some issues about how that works. And there's some, some limitations for that type of classification. And what we're doing is pretty novel. We're looking at DNA to try and track and trace marijuana samples, um, just like we do with all human uh, samples in forensic science. So all organisms have DNA. Um, and just like we have built a national CODIS database for tracking felons and uh, violent criminals, and it's shown that it's very, very effective in forensic DNA analysis, now we're moving on to other organisms. And the one that we're funded to look at is for cannabis. Um, just to give you a little perspective on the organism, uh, probably everybody here knows what it is. They've heard about it. But you might be surprised to know it's not very well classified. Uh, at the genetic level. So we know very little about its DNA. And so one thing that you have to do before you track and trace something is fully characterize it. So that's what we're funded to do, is, is look at the genetics of different populations out there and define them so that we can trace them. So 
In the 1930s, the history of, of marijuana is, is pretty broad, um, and in the 1930s, cannabis was legal in the U.S. It was grown for, the, by, for fiber. Um, it was not considered a drug because the fiber varieties of cannabis um, have very low THC content, about 0.2%. So you could smoke it if you want to, but it'll give you an unbelievable headache. It's, um, it's known as ditchweed. It's still present in the Midwest. Um, there are some natural populations, and we are working with a group in Nebraska that is providing us with samples so we can genotype a, a natural population and see what that looks like. Um, so it was grown on a pretty regular basis and on a large scale as uh, like cotton or corn. Um, but later it was banned when they realized that they couldn't easily distinguish the fiber form from the drug form. So that became a law enforcement problem. How can we tell the difference between what you're going to weave into clothing um, or, and versus what uh, people are going to uh, use for drugs? That's the 1930s perspective. This is the West Coast perspective on marijuana. Um, at the federal level, marijuana has been scheduled as a Schedule I drug. There is no medical value, according to the Drug Enforcement Agency, and it is not legal to have in any way, shape, or form. Um, having said that, there are some states that have decided to make cannabis available for medical purposes. And those states have their own state legislation that has passed um, and criteria for who can have it and how much you can have. And it's usually very small amounts and it's supposed to be with a physician's approval. Um, and it's for, and they have to be registered to have that and, and to obtain it. Now this is obviously of interest at, at the, for attorneys because there's a discrepancy between the federal law and the state law now. Um, and the feds always supersede the state legislation, but they're not going to use all their resources to go in after someone who is maybe in chemotherapy and wants to have a little bit of marijuana to alleviate the nausea that they're feeling. So they're trying to find that middle ground um, with legislation. That's another reason why we're being funded to do this project is because uh, how are you going to differentiate medical marijuana from all the other stuff that's grown by drug dealers um, out, say, in Mexico, for example? One way that you can differentiate this material is to barcode it or use DNA uh, to do that. So um, as soon as they went through this in California, the state uh, had, had approved for certain purposes um, medical marijuana, unfortunately what they found was an explosion of people who are interested in this industry. And now they have, um, for example, in 2010 they have more than 4,000 medical marijuana distributors or dispensaries in Los Angeles alone. Now California is a big state. If you multiply that number out across all the cities, you could see that there would be a fairly big law enforcement issue that was happened very, very quickly. So the intent of the legislation was good. Unfortunately, due to their proximity to the Mexican border and some other issues, um, they really were not able to restrict this in the way that they wanted to. So now they face a major law enforcement problem and they um, are one of the agencies that is funding us um, to try and figure out what to do about their marijuana problem. Their marijuana problem consists of basically uh, pharmacies where people can go in um, and get marijuana in uh, small amounts, um, but it, there's, they, they aren't really being proofed for their card or their registration um, or, or their age in particular. In fact, they have videos of, say, 10 and 11 year olds on skateboards that are riding up to these dispensaries and just basically getting marijuana. Um, so that certainly isn't what um, the state or federal legislations in, um, had, had intended. Um, the other problem that they have that I'll, I'll tell you uh, about a, a little bit more when I show the video is that the federal parks um, out in California, Yosemite National Park, Redwood National Park, parks that are very well known, paid for by your tax dollars, have now been taken over in some sections by fairly violent uh, drug cartels. And they are using that public land to grow marijuana to feed the dispensaries in California. Um, so that's, that's a law enforcement issue that I'm talking about on, West, on the West Coast that we're actually trying to assist them with. So 
Um, how can you go about trying to track and trace things, regulate uh, marijuana? Um, the first thing you have to do is find a way to really barcode it, and that's what we're doing here at UNH. Um, one thing you have to distinguish between is the drug variety, which is the high THC content, and the fiber varieties. Um, and we have the ability to do that. We've been funded by Tommy Lanier, who is the director of the National Marijuana Initiative. He's a point person for many, many, many different agencies. And you'll see those in my last slide. We have a lot of uh, support from a variety of agencies for doing this. Um, it's a five-year funded project um, to develop a DNA system to track and trace samples. And they are our sole dealer, if you will, or provider of samples. They take them from different crime scenes or different um, parks and mail them to us and ask us to um, generate DNA profiles and give back reports. And that's what a lot of folks are, are working on um, when they're getting research credit um, in our department. So we're funded by ONDCP and NMI. Uh, the samples are coming a lot of times from DEA, but they're coordinated through these agencies. And what uh, students are doing is processing reference samples from uh, labeled varieties, from seeds, um, to build a reference library. And then they're also taking card punches from samples that were collected from the parks or from crime scenes and genotyping both sets. And then we're basically matching them together, just like we do with the human CODIS system. So it's a proof in principle study and it's working. I must say I'm very delighted because it's working very well. Um, we call the DNA marker that we're using NMI01 for National Marijuana Initiative because that's who funded us. Um, we found that it's very, very variable in different populations we looked at. So we can tell the difference between ditch weed in Nebraska and uh, drug samples coming from different sources. This gives you an idea of what the data looks like. It's very similar to human DNA profiles. And um, the, the technology appears to be working quite well. And it's been in place for about two years now. So now, now that we have the technology worked out, we have to look at how can we figure out where this material is coming from, because that's one of their, their big issues. And most people who work with uh, law enforcement, border patrol, customs, and, uh, uh, and the undercover agents, they're dealing with this end of the spectrum here, the dealers and the dispensaries. Um, so they're, they're basically targeting the ground level issues, the marijuana that you can see that's growing, um, that they can recover uh, from the parks or from people's property or from vehicles or crime scenes. We're going towards the front end of this process where we're saying, well, where are these seeds coming from? How are they getting their starting material? We don't know. Um, and they don't know. These guys, they say, well, we buy it from over the internet. It's not legal to buy it from the internet, but a lot of stuff can be purchased and not be detected as it's being mailed from, say, Europe into the US. So that's one source, international seed suppliers. Um, or it may be that they're getting it from within the US through a distributor that's connected through these international suppliers. Either way, it's not legal for US citizens to buy it um, or import it. And that's where the Customs and Border Patrol aspect comes in. Um, why is that an issue? Um, because if you think back to the anthrax cases in Connecticut from a long time ago, from 2001 or so, that's exactly how those uh, spores were disseminated through the mail, right? So, yep. Um, okay, so Connecticut, um, the reason why I mention this is Connecticut had a casualty from the anthrax spore uh, cases. There, there were terrorist groups um, and individuals, you know, kind of working with them that obtained anthrax, um, which is uh, potentially lethal if you inhale it, um, placed it in envelopes, most of them directed towards uh, senators or um, news anchors, people of, of pub, you know, public view. Um, they mailed those spores in envelopes addressed to those individuals through our U.S. Postal Service. And um, some other envelopes and magazines got cross-contaminated with spores that fell out of the envelopes. Um, one of our Connecticut citizens um, here, uh, an older woman who was, I believe, in her 80s, um, accidentally uh, contracted uh, anthrax from some of those stray spores and died um, from that. And, and so the reason why I mention that is 
when you think about people buying a few seeds across the border and illegally importing things into the U.S., when you look at the big picture, we have a major enforcement problem because we have free access and free ability for people to use our mail system in a variety of ways. And um, that's, that's why we're, we're also working with U.S. Border and Customs Patrol because we have some concerns. We've seen the downside of that, the negative effect of having a free and open mailing system um, and what people can use it for. So it can be used for bioterrorist agents. It can also be used to supply drug cartels. Um, it's a way of getting across our borders that's not easy to enforce. Okay, um, so what we've done here for a project is we've had um, samples provided to us from two European com uh, companies. Um, they're labeled as Sensi Seeds and Mr. Nice Seeds. Um, they provide 10 or 15 marijuana seeds at a time. Uh, and you can purchase them illegally through the internet, put your money in a Swiss bank account. Um, they may or may not send you the seeds. There's no quality assurance or guarantee or consumer protection if you're buying illegal substances across the border. Um, but that's uh, uh, one thing that, that this is definitely a source that we're, we're trying to track to. So uh, a lot of folks, if you've heard from Amsterdam, I don't know if anyone's been to Amsterdam here, anybody? A couple of you. Um, Europe has got a different viewpoint on marijuana than the U.S. Um, they allow, they, it's not legal, but they allow coffee shops to basically be in public areas and they don't bother them. And, and in those coffee shops, you can go in and buy marijuana in small quantities and you can buy seeds. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people will go to um, Europe, buy those seeds, and bring them back across the U.S. border. And so that's a, a major source. Either they're mailing them or they're bringing them across the borders. And again, that's where Customs and Border Patrol um, comes into play. Um, so we have some of those seized materials. Um, we built a reference library, genotyped all of those materials. And when we looked at the DNA profiles and did an analysis, um, we found that we could group out two major sources from Europe, Sensi Seeds and Mr. Nice Seeds. And uh, we did an internet search on the history of that and found that both of those companies, which are pretty major companies and suppliers, were originally owned by one group called Greenhouse Seeds. So that's their founder population of marijuana. The two people who uh, built greenhouse seeds had an argument at one point in time and split and created their own two businesses. And it's really interesting when you look at the genetics that we can actually see that. We can, we can our genetics information parallels the history that's written on, on the internet. Um, so the genetics supports, um, supports that. What you might not be able to see in the back is some of these things here that say Orient Express, Ziploc bags, source unknown. There's a lot of things on this scale here that were seized coming across the border that were genotyped and then mapped to this reference database. So now we have a way of using DNA, um, taking things that are seized by uh, you know, law enforcement agencies in the Postal Service and saying, where did that actually come from? because it's not usually sent from the postmark where it originated from. So that's, that's pretty, um, pretty good stuff. And we have a recent article uh, published in JFS in September of 2011 that talks about some of the technology um, that, that we've been doing. So I'll just refer to that, um, or refer you to that. Um, basically, we have samples that were collected on the borders. We have dispensary samples, we have hashish, we have all kinds of other samples, and we were able to cross-correlate and cross-connect some of those together using genetics. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons why we want to track this material. Um, it's obviously trace material that's associated with major crime. Long term, it has negative health effects, and it also has this interesting legislation issue that goes along with it. Um, Going back to the 1930s again, just to give you some other, more pictures, uh, it was a very, very large part of our agricultural um, base in the U.S. It was grown for fiber, for oil. It's a component of bird seed even today. Um, it was grown for cattle feed, health and beauty products, um, and you were required to register to grow it. 
So there's a little bit of a parallel between the 1930s agriculture and the medical dispensary uh, registration uh, that's going on. Again, it was uh, in a very low THC content um, and a not a usable, uh, smokable format. Still used um, for fiber production in a lot of Europe and in Canada. So it's still around all the time, um, and it's something that you can easily hide drug forms in. So this just gives you an idea of how, how many acres are grown and what the production is in Canada alone in, from 1998 to 2010. So you can see the production kind of fluctuates a little bit. And one thing you might not know uh, about Canada is that they have a very, very effective DNA barcoding system for marijuana because they still produce hemp. They have taken one form of medical marijuana, barcoded it, and said, this is the only kind we're gonna allow people to have. That is medical marijuana, and everything else can be eradicated or considered hemp form. And it's, it's easy to enforce their policies because they've coded for it and, and have a genetic barcode. Yes? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why. Um, that's 2006, so there's a spike of production in 1999 and another spike in 2006. It may parallel legislation or use. Um, I, I'm not really sure what the, what the, what the um, spikes in production would be, but you can see that it's still a pretty significant part of, of their um, agricultural um, base in Canada. So Canada has a really nice model system and we're actually looking to try and do that here in, in the US. Um, just some example of products, uh, hemp seed oil, things that you might not have seen, uh, rope, a lot of things are, are uh, hemp, but that's uh, unprocessed hemp and you can process it. So a lot of the rope that you see in hardware stores or on uh, major ships is all made out of hemp. It's a great fiber, very, very strong. Um, a lot of beauty products um, from long ago and still now if you go into any kind of pharmacy you'll see hemp in your shampoo, hemp in your soap, cannabis uh, in it. Um, so uh, again, our question is how best to classify these different forms. Why don't we just use chemistry? We all know that chemistry is available out there. Um, it, we do use chemistry now to classify different forms. Uh, it's based on the THC content, which is a, a chemical um, that is present in very low amounts, 0.2 to 0.3 percent. In ditch weed, the natural populations are fiber forms. Low-grade marijuana from Mexico is 4 to 5 percent. And then the really sophisticated drug operations that are going on in California are 18 to 21 percent. So when you think about the effects on the body, there's a pretty big difference from 0.2 to 4 to 18 to 21 percent. So um, there's, there's definitely a reason why you would want to monitor this as the THC content has increased. Um, certainly the side effects will increase as well. Um, why is chemistry not the only method we want to use? Because marijuana both its shape and the way it grows and the chemi chemistry content can be affected by the age of the plant, the size of the plant, the conditions under which it's grown. So one of the reasons why you have this pool of very, very high concentration THC is because now we grow it hydroponically. If we're an illegal drug dealer, it's a multi-million dollar industry and they want to grow it fast, quick, clean, and they want the highest THC content possible. Um, so it's definitely going to have a much different effect on people than what it had perhaps in the 70s. Um, so there are actually other types of assays that are out there that can distinguish. Um, our, ours will characterize specifically what marijuana is. We can map it to the source. And then there's another assay that has uh, been developed that will distinguish the difference between drug and fiber varieties. So DNA can do it all if we put the technology into place. Um, this just gives you an idea of the types of profiles you would see if um, you're looking at that kind of technology. This is for the active form, so this is the drug form. You get a profile that looks like this, and this is for the fiber form. So you can definitely, in a very quick assay, tell the difference between the two. And again, the issues for enforcement that we're interested in is importation of seeds, where is it coming from, 
Is it coming across the borders physically walking across from Mexico? Is it being shipped in from Europe and Canada? Um, what other kinds of issues are we concerned about? And one thing I will add to that anthrax comment is one very big concern about uh, the California situation besides the federal park issues is what happens if someone were to lace the marijuana with something else? We would have a large, large segment of the population that would be immediately ill and immediately uh, potentially poisoned. Um, and so when you look at the big picture beyond just that small joint or a small bag that's used for, for um, medical purposes, and you look at it kind of from above at the global national level, you say this has great potential to affect a large number of people in a large number of ways, um, both either through getting them hooked and then adding a, a nasty poison to it so you have large scale emergency room visits and, and death, uh, which is bioterrorist uh, activity. Um, you also have the long-term effects, uh, health care effects, um, where when you have 20% THC, you're going to increase the amount of psychosis, schizophrenia, um, other types of issues that you're going to see after 20 years of use. So maybe not the first day or two you use it, but over long-term use, you actually have significant deterioration uh, of uh, individuals awareness and ability to uh, connect with reality um, and there's a lot of documentation about people who suffer psychotic episodes and working in forensic science a lot of the interviews that you see in crime uh, logs are basically uh, psychotic events people who killed somebody but don't have any recollection of having done it because they were a either on a, a drug at the time or they were not um, connected with reality, um, which is considered a psychotic event. So we're worried about that kind of increasing as the THC level has increased. And then on top of that, we have the public lands uh, part and concern for public safety, people driving and, and actually entering into federal lands. And that's the video I wanted to show you because it's really hard to convey the extent of the problem without actually seeing the federal national park land issue. Um, and that's, that's uh, one of the ones that we're really focused on. Unfortunately, the penalties have been fairly light. They've been about eight years in prison. So uh, it's, it's hard uh, to connect all of the sources to, we can connect to him as a supplier, but it's hard to tally all of that up over time because basically when they go and convict someone, it's a snapshot in time. We seize this amount of material and it's connected to that person through internet uh, records and that sort of thing. Um, but you can't really say, well, he's connected to 10 years worth of supplying. Um, you can speculate on that. but And that's, unfortunately, when you can't connect all that together, um, it keeps the penalties uh, lower. So it's not life in prison. It's not 20 years in prison. Uh, it's hard to measure the impact of, of even one supplier. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, their job is to do quality control on pharmaceuticals, uh, any you know uh, legal medicine that you have, and any kind of food products, right down to your cereal, the number of particles of insects that can be in your dry cereal that you eat in the morning. That's their job, is to regulate that. Um, a lot of times, uh, they, they regulate it because people basically can make more money if they loosen up on the quality assurance standards. They don't have to throw as, away as much of the product. So the concern would be for marijuana, since it isn't a regulated substance um, by the FDA, it's just simply seized, is that the user doesn't really have any guarantee of what that material is. It could be insecticide poisoning. The insecticides that are used to increase the yield of the crop could have a pretty toxic effect on your nervous system when you inhale them and smoke them. So that's one, one aspect uh, where we would think about accidental poisoning, maybe not intentional consumer poisoning. So it could be the drink the Kool-Aid kind of effect where they intentionally just try and create a, a, a mass scare of consumers, but that's going to be a one-shot deal. Um, it could be a more longer term, you know, slow insecticidal kind of poisoning. Um, there's also accidental mold or fungicide uh, or fungal growth. Um, so even, even other biologicals could create uh, an allergic reaction in a, a certain segment of the population. So it's a concern because it's not regulated. Okay. 
Um, so that brings up another issue as far as who is liable. Um, if states are thinking about legalizing medical marijuana and there is no source in the U.S. where you can obtain that, where is it coming from? And who's doing quality control on that? And that right now there is no answer to that. Um, so uh, basically they would be purchasing it from illegally from another source and growing it and they're simply um, not going to be prosecuted um, at the federal level because they're going to have small amounts and be registered. Um, but that again brings up a, a, a difference between the U.S. and the Canadian system. The Canadian system said we're going to do quality control and barcode certain amounts and that way we won't be so worried about what we've allowed some of our citizens to have. Um, and frankly, I think that's probably a, a safer approach if you're going to pass that kind of legislation. But you have to have a way to, to, to barcode it and monitor it. So as of uh, February 2012, um, there's 17 states that have pending legislation to, to legalize it, but they don't really have an effective plan in place for how to monitor it or distribute it or provide quality control. Um, so this is, um, again, we're working on the law enforcement side, but it could be applied for, for both sides. As long as you can barcode it, you can track it, you can trace it, you can provide quality control. For law enforcement, we're using it already to provide investigative leads. It could be used as probable cause for search warrants. Um, we're trying to link cases together to increase the penalties. So if you can show that somebody has a small amount here and a small amount there, but they're all working together as a network, that's called racketeering. And you can um, certainly increase the penalties to up to 20 years or more in prison. Um, also, um, as I was speaking to someone very early on here um, while I was sitting uh, here, um, most of the dealers, some of them will tell you information, but you can't really verify it. You know, what is it? Um, what is the genetics of it? How good is it? They'll all claim that their stuff is the best stuff, of course. So um, one way that we can kind of track and trace and help with that information in court is, is by barcoding it. Um, and then, um, so that's what we're doing here. We're building reference libraries. We're fine tuning the, the DNA process. We have it down pretty well. Um, we're trying to validate the technology for court admissibility for whatever purpose it may be used. And we're certainly looking at trying to establish this concept of number of plants because that will come into play for penalties as well. Um, how many plants are you allowed? If medical marijuana is passed in the state of California and you're allowed to have six plants growing, how do you define six plants? Well, it's easy if they're growing in pots, but if they're in a bag, how do you know what that represents? Um, and so that, that's, you know, they've, they've passed legislation that has not really been uh, fully defined yet. And so we've got a, this conflict um, that we're trying to help resolve. Um, so um, I'll, I'll just stop there before I put in the video. Um, just wanted to mention again, Tommy Lanier um, has given us the funding for a five-year uh, research grant. A lot of students have been involved with generating the database. It has more than 100 samples now for the reference database. We have um, a lot of unknown samples seized from borders and through uh, the U.S. mail that have been matched to the database. So we, we've shown proof in principle. Um, we're still elucidating some of the varieties, trying to figure out how to barcode things best. And um, we're doing some sequencing currently, um, just in case we get a fragment uh, that shows up at a crime scene, can we figure out A, that it's marijuana, even if it has almost no THC content, and seeds and roots do not. So um, that can become an issue um, when you're going in to uh, a grow operation and someone has already cut all the plants down and taken them away. How do you prove that that's marijuana? Because there's no THC. So you could do this by doing DNA testing of, of those plants and show that this is indeed marijuana. So it's, it's support for law enforcement. And it's a great project for everybody here at UNH uh, to keep working on. The barcoding aspect, uh, we have been working since about 2001 on various methods. Um, the one for, funded by NIJ uh, was a three-year project. Uh, we used a technique called AFLP. It worked great on fresh samples, but not very well on uh, dried samples. And as you probably know, most of the stuff that's on the streets has been dried or cured in some fashion. So now we're using this new marker, and it works great on everything. And uh, so that's why we're going forward with the databasing. Right now, it's wholly funded by the National Marijuana Initiative, which is a law enforcement agency. They offer free testing. Um, so, and we give the reports back to them, and then they, they use them as, as they wish, as investigative leads. Um, 
we would really like to see agencies coming to us with, um, a, and, and we offer the service for a fee, and that fee could be kicked back into a research fund for UNH students. So that would be a great opportunity. We're not at that point yet, but it's kind of under discussion right now. What we're finding is that when you compare data points for different varieties, we can match them base, together based on their um, parentage. So they will have, if they have a white widow strain and a skunk strain, which are two varieties, common variety names, if they're crossed together, we can see that that group will cluster together compared to something that is from another supplier um, based on percent shared DNA. So um, it's always a snapshot in time. There's always going to be new stuff on the market. Um, but fortunately, just like humans, you can show families are more related um, than unrelated individuals. And that'll help us with trying to track it. You know, is it coming from China? Is it coming from Europe? Is it coming from Mexico? Um, we, can, we can see clusters of, of different populations. It is true. <laughs> it's, um, it's the only government marijuana facility. It's heavily secure. They grow different varieties. Um, so University of Mississippi is, is known for that. And um, they do a lot of the chemistry studies um, for THC content. They've set the baselines for all that with all the different populations. They have a lot of different seed varieties, and they grow them out. Um, that would be probably the most likely place if we were to have a medical marijuana growing facility. It would be probably at University of Mississippi because they're set up to do that. So uh, we'd have to agree upon a variety that we considered appropriate, barcode it, and then that would be the one that would be distributed and quality controlled if that was approved by the federal government. So, yep, that's true. Um, in Canada, the, the Canadian um, group that I mentioned before, they used to grow it in a mine shaft. Um, so they had their very own supply and they had a, an elevator that went down into an underground mine shaft and um, it was heavily secured as well. And they grow it in this greenhouse environment in the mine shaft and then uh, distribute it through just a couple of suppliers for the medical aspect. Um, so pretty tightly controlled. Um, just to give you an idea of the other agencies that are working with us, um, Besides ONDCP and NMI, U.S. Department of Justice, uh, DEA, National Park Service, U.S. Department of Interior, San Diego County Task Force for Narcotics, Customs and Border Patrol, and Nebraska, Wesleyan University for the Ditchweed. So, and um, our most recent collaborator is the Connecticut Ag Station, just about two miles away, where we have three students that are working on sequencing um, different parts of the marijuana uh, genome. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Um, can I think we're heading in that direction. I definitely think um, with that many states having state legislation in, in play, at some point it's going to be a huge conflict with the federal government legislation. Um, and there's, it's going to be hard. And, and since we have huge enforcement problems going on, I think someone's going to have to step in and say, you know, this is what we're going to consider a medical, and everything else is going to be for the task force folks for enforcement. And that's that they effectively handled that in Canada. They have a good model system. Um, you know, whether you're in favor or against it, um, it's it's probably the most efficient way to to get it. Um, under control, I guess, so to speak. And you'll see that in the video. This gives you an idea of the extent of, of the issue and who we're working with and who we're trying to help support um, as far as uh, investigative leads. And uh, it's not just all from Mexico anymore. A lot of it's grown inside the US borders, as you can see, uh, by some of these cartels and then being distributed onto the streets. So um, that's all I have for today. Thank you all for coming.